oh, this is wonderful blessings and just mm -hmm. try and work. Off Broadway playwright. I'm an off Broadway yeah. playwright. Off Broadway playwright. Yeah. That was yeah. quick. Because happy fucking New Year. Happy <laughs> fucking New Year, 2018. 2018 is looking <laughs> wonderful. Happy New Year, everyone. Welcome to Regarding. This is a talk show where we talk about fire theater. Theater spelled with an R-E. Like his shirt. Shout out Papi Yamanochi. Yo, you make a good? very good Christmas present. Thank you. Thank I'm you. I'm a size small. Shout out to you. <laughs> My name is Ray Yamanochi. I'm a playwright. My name is Maria Pazalegre. I am an artist and a theater critic. So today at Regarding, we have a special episode. Instead of talking about theater shows, I want to talk about why I decided to start this talk show, um, and also about the larger role of theater critics of color in the field. And for that, we have special guest here with us today, Jose Solis, uh, Chief Theater Critic at Stage Buddy. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. I started regarding uh, because I just felt like there was a dearth of critics of color in the field. It was very homogenous, aka very white. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the shows that I thought deserved or were sort of misunderstood in a way uh, we're getting shat on, um, and I just thought it wasn't fair, and I just also wanted to level the playing field. Well, we need diverse theater, and we need diverse critics to discuss the diverse theater. It takes a lot to put yourself up on stage, and that's why we felt like there should be representation in that field. The first thing I kind of want to talk about may seem like an obvious question, but what is the role of a theater critic? Because what's different about theater and film and other forms of art is that theater is so ephemeral that the critic's role in it can really make or break a show. Whereas in film or you know, paintings or whatever, um, the artwork can outlive the review. And so do you feel like it's, we have to look at the art differently and, and sort of talk about it differently to the public? There's something that I've been saying a lot recently and I feel like people look at me like I'm some crazy person. So I've been saying, at least with theater, I think it applies to all the arts actually, but at least especially with theater, I think the word review is completely obsolete because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's very passive. Right. It's indicating that you are re-watching something, reliving something that, you know, if you're reading a review, mm -hmm. you weren't there to begin with, with the person, right? So you mm -hmm. technically can be reviewing something that you haven't viewed once. So I'm a huge advocate for critics to not be reviewers, but to be interpreters. So nothing gives me more pleasure than reading mm. when a critic writes what the show meant for them and to them, rather than pretending that they can, you know, be like the the, the end all for <laughs> what a show is. God. Yes. Right. Yeah, no, can I make a mean. suggestion? Yeah. Because it's a question that I would love to ask you guys also yeah. is, what do you think should be in a review? I think a review should really uh, take into consideration the genuineness of what the, the performance can give an audience. And I just feel like, especially critics, because they see so many shows that they frequently get jaded, right? And I, and I see yeah. reviews where, yeah, where, where it pinpoints so much of like the technical elements or flaws in the plot or flaws in the acting. Mm. Um, but there are certain shows that really gift the audience something really special. Mm. And it's like those shows especially, I really think should be, you know, brought up and you know, reviewed a little differently. I know that's almost biased in a way, <laughs> but this is what I mean by theater criticism being different from film criticism. You know, it can, if you get a bad review, mm -hmm. it's gonna tank the show and no one's gonna see it when I think it can actually be really moving to a vast majority of the people. I don't think it's wise to see theater without having that objectivity because there are political ramifications and if you look at theater as art and art as a discussion, then this is something that should be considered and encapsulated because I feel like no piece of theater that goes up in, in this year, in 2017, in 2018 now, nothing that goes up should not go out, go, go out with a certain you know thought to how the audience is going to perceive it and who is the audience and who do they want this audience to be? Who do they want to reach with this? Like, what is your goal with this? And if you don't take into consideration what's happening in this, in this world, then maybe you should reconsider what you're putting up. I think that's a really fascinating point because, and please don't kick me out of the show. No, we but, love you. Um, <laughs> but I think it's really hard to be, you know, objective when you're a critic because the only person you can be objective to is yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I think all criticism is completely subjective. But I, I do think that it's important for critics to know what's going on in the world. 
but but hearing you talk for instance just make me think how sometimes there's you go see a show and you realize you have nothing to say about the show mm. nothing either positive or negative you simply have nothing to say about it and i agree that all art is political even before this disastrous election happening <laughs> we're all terrified but you know it, it's really interesting i think that's a debate that's like going to be open forever but i do think that white critics especially need to do their homework because mm. it's exhausting to have to explain to them i'm talking from personal experience i've done it endless times uh having to explain to them you know why i know how to speak two languages or how i don't need to translate things from spanish to english before i say them out loud or why I mean, when they know that I'm gay, they ask me, and they see like a gay character on stage, they'll ask me, do you think he was the top or the bottom? And wow. that kind of thing. So, I mean, we live in a world where it's moving so fast. And I feel that the biggest problem with criticism is that the critics who are writing for the major outlets are pretty old. Mm -hmm. They're pretty white. So they have like super narrow worldview. And it's not their fault. I mean, I think that if we all were like, you know, white straight dudes, we would probably take advantage <laughs> of our privilege, right? So I think that's the, that's the main problem. Like they mm. they don't know about this because they don't need to know about this. They don't need their worlds don't benefit from knowing about different cultures, different languages, different lifestyles. Yeah. There was an incident last year where uh, a theater critic uh, got into some pretty hot water for negatively reviewing a show n not necessarily based off of the artistic ability which they uh, elevated they thought was fantastic but that they didn't think that certain elements of black lives matter was real that no cops are not objectively targeting black people this is this is this isn't true this shouldn't be like it was offensive to them so they called it out and there was a great call for, what are you doing? <laughs> like, girl, like, why, why are you reviewing this type of theater if you are not aware of the climate of the world right now? Because it's not like this is new. This has been going on for, for years at this point. So you need to examine yourself. And also, is this really someone that should be representing um, your publication and it was a great question and i think that really that really made me want to get into criticism more because as a person of color i know that i would have looked at that production very differently but because i also have a different worldview and i think that there while there is a need for theater criticism there is a need for critics of color it is it is necessary if we need diverse theater we need diverse critics we live in an age where information sharing is the norm um, and show score is now sort of becoming a lot bigger. Sort of like a crowdsourced Yelpy sort of thing where mm. it's like, oh, you know, the crowd loves this. In this sort of climate, do you think critics are still important? Absolutely. Because, I mean, being a critic, I feel requires, oh god, I hope I don't sound like some old crazy person right now. But being a critic requires a level of preparation and knowledge that other people don't have. It's like, you know, like you wouldn't go to to a doctor to ask for a recipe. Or you might. I mean, maybe doctors don't have to. I don't know. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. Like, you, you know who to go to for the things that they, they're good at and that they know of. So even if people always say everyone can be a critic because everyone has an opinion, that's absolutely right. But not everyone has the preparation and the knowledge to tie the things that you were talking about, for instance. Not everyone would go see uh, Master Harold and think about Black Lives Matter. Some people would just think, oh, this was fun or this was not fun. Mm. So I feel that, yeah, we are, we're a dying breed, but we are necessary. Um, the way that I like to think about, about potential readers and potential viewers is that I want to be their friend. I don't want to be some dictator or some judge telling them, don't see this, go see this. Uh, you know, I can't tell them how to spend their money or how to spend their time. But one of my favorite things to do is find a critic who, uh, even if I don't necessarily share their tastes, but who I love reading. Because criticism, reading criticism should feel like you're talking to a friend and you can go and ask them yes. questions and you can follow up. It shouldn't be, you know, like some like, schoolmaster going like, mm, do this or do that. 
So January we got a few shows that we're excited about. Uh, I'm really excited about my friend Milo Kramer's show at the Bushwick Star. It's called Cute Activist. It's directed by Morgan Green. Uh, I really suggest you check it out. He's a really great playwright. Um, yeah, I'm really excited about it. I'm really looking forward to something at the end of the month. Labyrinth Theater is having its 25th anniversary and I believe they're having uh, 13 plays by some lab members and for the first time in a few years they've inducted some new members so that's really exciting. They've got some new young blood in there and also related, they're doing it at the Cherry Lane, uh, Cherry Lane Theater and look out for Anytime Cherry Lane throughout the year are doing fundraisers for Puerto Rico and Mexico. So definitely check out what they're doing. I am so excited. Well, it's Cherry, so all the theater festivals are happening. Mm -hmm. And I am really looking forward to seeing Aquanera at Prototype Festival, it's directed by Daniel Fish. It's an opera about horror movies and how classic movies from the 1940s and how the camera affects the way people think. Mm -hmm. And, you know, first of all, I would go see anything Daniel Fish is involved in. Uh, so the idea of a Daniel Fish opera made me think of mm -hmm. something like, uh, like the shape of water and what it does. I love things that, you know, like mash genres together. All right, well, thank you, Jose, for coming on. Thank you both for having me. Thank I you. love talking to you. Thank you. Uh, anything that's going on in your life? My new CD is coming up next month. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, no, but I, if your viewers think this is completely uncommon, which it is, I mean, you're not going to see a bunch of people of color talking about theater, like, ever, except... Here's yeah. the date. Yeah. We'll put it down oh, here. It's yeah. magic. Yeah, yeah. We'll put it's it down here. the Saturday of... Broadway Con at 4 p.m. Uh, we're gonna be doing the very first panel comprised entirely of critics of color. Mm. You won't see a single white man on that panel. Yo, what's good? We out so, here. So, but if you if you can make it, if you, if you can come to Broadway Con and if you can make it to New York, please send us your questions. You can find me on Twitter. Find us and send us your questions because we really would love to talk about you. And we're gonna make our best to you know record the panel anyway because we really want people to see what, what's happening. Go check out his writing at stagebuddy.com or right wherever here. you can find theater criticism. He's all over the place. So. Oh, I didn't see you there. Today we have actor, playwright, <laughs> renaissance woman from Pennsylvania by way of the world. She's got a new play up at the Atlantic starting January 10th. Give it up for her, Gus Magnani. Don't mind me, just drinking my playwright juice. <laughs> well, Ngozi, thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. Oh my god, you got a new play coming up. I do. It's so exciting. I do. It's terrifying and exciting. <laughs> <laughs> That's what new plays are. Yeah. <laughs> so just for our viewers, yeah. the, the play is basically about uh, this uh, writer, a this Nigerian writer. Yeah, a Nigerian back writer back. who's a best-selling novelist who goes back to where she was born and raised to care for her father. Gotcha. Um, and she sort of met with all the things that she has left behind, including her culture um, and her family and some other things. No spoiler alerts here. The, the goal was to originally write an adaptation of The Visit, actually. Mm -hmm. um, oh. I wonder why I like this one, like revenge story. Yeah. And then I was like, revenge, I'm like men, I'm like, get out of here. Yes. And then I was like, no. <laughs> I kind of wonder, like, it was just turning very much into a father daughter family love story. This is your first off Broadway play. Yeah, right? yeah, this is my off Broadway debut. Right. But you had a regional right. production of a play called Good Grief. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, which you, uh, you worked at that Rising Circle, right? Yeah, well, I worked at that Rising Circle. Yeah, uh, I, I did Rising Circle too. That's yeah, why I was like, yeah, Rising Circle. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, um, yeah. So did, that was Good Grief, and that was in LA, correct? Uh huh. But you were also in that. I was in that as well, yeah. yeah. Tell me about that a little bit. Uh, wow, that was intense. Um, also, the play was very autobiographical and it was um, about my best friend that I had lost, uh, one of my best friends that I had lost when I was 20. Um, so it was also just a really emotional play to do right. every day and work on. Um, and the play was about grief and losing people. Um, and so to do a play where you kind of actually conjure up this person that you once knew on stage like eight to nine shows a week in that regional schedule. Um, <laughs> uh, for the kids, Josie loves the kids. Um, she does. She I do, does. I really do. Um, was like wonderful, because basically, you know, you get to have catharsis every day on stage, but it was hard. It was beautiful, but it was hard to do. It was a hard show to do, yeah. So both of those plays uh, have a very 
uh, have, have a similar theme in that both of them are kind of homecoming plays. Mm -hmm. um, Good Grief, I believe you return to Pennsylvania, yeah. and in The Homecoming Queen you return to Nigeria. Yeah. So, like, what draws you to that theme? Um, as someone who is, I'm, I'm first generation, and so mm -hmm. as someone who I think is, is as someone who's bicultural, you know, mm -hmm. I feel at times very African and mm -hmm. uh, very American and pulled between many identities as a black woman, but as a black woman raised in a very white suburb, um, but um, as someone who's also like very African and, you know, has a very Nigerian name, um, I kind of tend to talk about things that are really personal. And so like, you know, with Good Grief, that was a very autobiographical thing and dedicated to someone very special. And this play is very much dedicated to my dad and my heritage. So for me, it's like I try and pull some things that are really sort of um, intimate and sort of like intimate thoughts. And if I think about the intimate stuff, then I'll actually want to write it. Um, and so that stuff tends to be about myself or my family. And it's not necessarily them, but it's all sort of very much inspired by the things that I'm struggling with and so like the first play was about struggling with grief and getting over someone and the fact that you don't and this play I think is struggling with how to reconcile family and heritage and trauma um, and what healing actually is within a black community and, and this specific black community being Nigerian. For this uh, this production, mm -hmm. you have Mufoni Zodofia, who is also a playwright, wrote Sojourners mm -hmm. and her portmanteau. She's a bad, and bad And she's woman. playing mm -hmm. the lead. She is. I'm like, wait a minute. Yeah! Yeah! yeah. Wait a That's minute. the story. No, I was like, wait yeah. a minute. You, so you got a writer to play. Yes, I did. Was that like Cross. from the jump? Was that something? Oh, this is what I want to do. Did, are you closer to? Mufa? I am mm, funny, so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I've known her for God. How many? Known her since like two thousand nine. Not forever, I guess, like, you know, right. but almost like seven or eight years. Um, we actually were in this writing project group called the First Generation Nigerian Project. Mm -hmm. So it was me, yeah. her, uh, Joanna Toma. Um, Jennifer Akabu and um, in, in this iteration and Yvonne Oji who's on Insecure. But I have done a number of workshops in the last year of this play and I had asked her to do a super early one. She wasn't able to do it. And so we were just kind of like, I'm okay, I'll buy my time. I'm all like, you know, <laughs> like I know you're busy. I know you yeah. put me on playwright at all. I know you're getting the reviews, but right, right, right. you know, I just very much had an idea of like, I wanted a scribe to talk about being a scribe. So uh, she had done the new Harmony workshop Oh, cool, cool, cool. Um, that that's we had, in Indiana? That's in Indiana, New yeah. Harmony, Indiana. Yeah. Uh, shout out to New Harmony. Um, to you. And <laughs> uh, we had asked her to do it, and uh, she did it, and I was like, it's her. So now that you are an off-Broadway playwright, <laughs> if you could give advice to your younger self, <sighs> what is something that you think you would say? Younger playwright self or just younger self self? Because younger, I'm still a young playwright. This is play number two. This is like, I'm only like three or four years out. Well, writing. since you, you're an actor and a playwright, I guess, you know, either. I guess yeah. younger self really, uh, play, writing was always my, like, my thing. Mm -hmm. I was a poet. <laughs> That's such a <laughs> silly thing to call yourself um, if you're not actually good at it. But, um... Uh, I wanted to do poetry. I wanted to go to school for creative writing and poetry and then I ended up being an actor. Mm -hmm. So I guess for me, it's like listen to your first instincts or don't be afraid to tell your story. Your story is completely valid. Mm -hmm. um, and you will, and again, you will, find your, you will find your audience. You know, like your story is valid. And that audience may not look like the Atlantic Theater. That audience may look like 30 people in this room. That your audience may look like Bushwick Star. It might look like Ars Nova. It mm -hmm. might look like Dixon Place. You know what I mean? Yeah. It might look like Lincoln Center, you know? But it's okay if it doesn't look like Lincoln Center. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> that was the, you know, and I hope they don't throw tomatoes at us, you know? Mm -hmm. um, that was the only goal. And so for me, it's remember that that's the goal. The goal is to make the thing, invite the people, and like, get them to love it, you know, and 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 be as honest as you possibly can. That's the main thing. That your stories are completely and totally worth it. And keep the goals the pure is the wrong word, but keep the goals simple. And the goal is to get people to see it and to like make the thing. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? All right. Last question. So. On our show, mm. we recommend great theater. We mm. recommend great fire off off Broadway, off Broadway theater. We would like you to recommend anything God. you want, anything you want to our audiences. I can recommend um, mezcal alcohol. Ah! Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
yeah. I can recommend Thanks Mezcal. God. It's got a smoky flavor. So good. Uh, it's not quite tequila, but it'll give it to you right so with mm. like a cherry salt pepper rim. It's like it's like the it's like the scotch of like clear liquors. Look, yeah, that's what I can recommend to you. That's what I got for you. Yo, mezcal, underrated liquor. Mezcal. Shout out mezcal. <laughs> Thank you for coming on. Thank, Thank you for having you. me. Absolute Thank you so pleasure. Much. Thanks, guys. That's our show. Go check out Ngezi's new play, The Homecoming Queen, at the Atlantic. Preview start January tenth. And you know you want more? To see the extended interview, please go to our website, retheater.nyc. You know you want to. Make sure you like and subscribe. Oh, it's so easy. It's just a little button, just a little boop. Love you guys. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Be good. Stay out of trouble.